Thank you, Sharon. It is good to have her back singing, and what a blessing it is. And she really has come through a journey in 2023, and we're trusting 2024 is going to be better for her. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 16? We're going to begin reading in Acts chapter 16 and verse 16 in just a few moments. You know, the Anglo-Zanzibar War was a military conflict back in 1896, and specifically the conflict between the two nations had to do with who would rule that particular country. The uh, Sultanate of Zanzibar passed away, and the people of Zanzibar replaced him with their own choice as leader. This did not set well with the British because five years earlier the two nations had entered an agreement that the British would actually uh, find the replacement and so that led to a war. Not too good for the Sultanate of Zanzibar because they lost uh, or had 500 casualties, deaths and injuries whereas only one sailor of the British was hurt. But what distinguishes this battle from every other war, we might call it, is that it is the shortest war on record. In fact, uh, historians note that the war was concluded somewhere between 38 to 45 minutes after the beginning of the conflict. In other words, in under half the time it would take to watch a Hallmark movie, that war was settled. And we all wish that every conflict could be such and that the casualties would be as few. But you know, as we are looking at Acts chapter 16 today, there's something that we all need to know. There's a war that's been going on uh, for a very long time. And this war is not between nations. It's a spiritual conflict between Almighty God, who is sovereign over all, and Satan, who himself tried to usurp authority. This war began in heaven years and years ago, and the war has been settled uh, when Jesus died and rose again. Uh, victory was declared in this war. But the problem is, even though the war has been settled, Battles continue to be engaged. Satan is still at work. Conflict still uh, going even today. As Satan fights, and this is important that we understand, he fights from a place of defeat. Well, you know, in our study in these first two missionary journeys, and our goal is uh, hopefully by this spring to have finished all three journeys, but we've seen clear evidence of what is called spiritual warfare, of a conflict and not seen, the source not seen with the eyes, but uh, the outworking of it we do see with our eyes. We saw it in our study in the first missionary journey as Paul and Barnabas faced persecution. We saw it as the gospel was being contested, and we saw even uh, how Satan tried to get between between two servants of God, Paul and Barnabas, to hinder the work. Nonetheless, as we have studied, uh, we see that the gospel is moving forward. Do you realize that the gospel is irrepressible? That this gospel that uh, God gave to us, that God originally gave to those first disciples, the good news of Jesus Christ, it cannot be stopped. Yet in the midst of that, we'll see today that there is a cosmic battle that is being fought between individuals and between entities, some of which are pawns in this particular conflict. And so today as we look at it, I want to look at these individuals and, and, uh, and hopefully we can gain some truths about this spiritual warfare. Look with me at Acts chapter 16, and I want to begin reading in verse 16. Once as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. 
When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrate stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. Let's pray together. Lord, as we look at another narrative, Lord, from Paul and Silas's second journey, um, Lord, we are reminded that even today, uh, there's this conflict that is going on. Father, we know that you, Lord Jesus, and God the Father, you operate from the position of victory. But Lord, we know that our adversary, the devil, who operates from a position of defeat is still uh, fighting, Lord, these battles. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that the ultimate victory has been attained through Christ. And if there be any here today who have not sided with God through Jesus Christ in faith, we pray today would be the day. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I shared just a couple of moments ago, we're in the midst of our study in the second missionary journey. Last week, if you were with us, we know that Paul and Silas and the team, they met a woman named Lydia who worked in purple textiles. And Lydia uh, had a gift of hospitality. We saw that she heard the gospel. She believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Her household did also. They were baptized. And at the very beginning, she opened her home to ministry. We talked about the signs of being a follower of Christ and, and the things that would accompany or follow true faith in Christ. We talked about baptism. We talked about uh, ministry, how if we're part of God's family, one of the evidences of that would be that we desire the fellowship, we desire the ministry. We also saw finally last week that when you are serving God, you can expect conflict. And that is exactly what we see today as Paul moves on. Paul is still in the city of Philippi. He is still ministering there. We see again, just as we saw last week and as we saw in the first journey, he was looking for fellowship. He was looking for the public place of prayer we see in verse 16. You know, prayer, corporate worship, and fellowship were a regular priority for the Apostle Paul. Have you ever stopped and thought about that? This man who was so great in the kingdom of God, who was used to write 13 out of 27 books of the New Testament, he was not a loner. He realized the importance of gathering with others for prayer and for fellowship and for mutual ed edification. If that's the case with Paul, how much more do you and I need the fellowship of the body of believers? So today we find Paul in Philippi. He's making his way to the place of prayer when all of a sudden trouble arises, not in the form of a military army or some type of weaponry that would lead to conflict, but they met a simple slave girl, but this slave girl, she was imprisoned, she was captured in a way, she was possessed by an evil spirit. And so we see in this not by chance encounter that Paul addresses the situation he brings deliverance for the slave girl, but what was deliverance for her actually led to external conflict for Paul and his companions. In a very real sense, they were in a war. Today, I want to look at the three individuals or entities that make up this account in human form. We're going to look at Paul, we're going to look at the servant girl, and then we're going to look at Paul's accusers. But as we look at these human uh, players, or we might call pawns, we need to understand today that while they're the instruments, they're the physical instruments that we see in this story, that being played out beneath all of this is a very serious and very life-changing in one way or direction spiritual battle. I want you to look with me first at Paul. He was determined and direct. We've seen that. Paul was very focused. 
Paul was so focused on advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I once had a professor who made it very clear. He said, don't show up late to my class. In fact, uh, someone tried him once, and as soon as they walked in, he said, you're out of there. And he immediately, no excuses, no, well, uh, my car didn't make it. No, well, I overslept. You are out of there. Why was that? He says, I've spent my time in preparation. I need the attention of those who are listening, and anyone who would be a distraction needs to be removed from the class. Believe me, I made it in time. You know, interruptions are a terrible thing, aren't they? You're, you're carrying on a conversation uh, with someone and someone interrupts. My, my good friend, George Light, one of the funniest things I ever heard, I was at Hampton, Sydney in a room. I was talking with him. We were, had been friends and, and teammates, and while we were there, Robert E. Lee V, direct descendant of Robert E. Lee, went to him, said he knocked on the door and began to walk into the room. And, and George said, Rob, what are you doing? Don't you see? He called me Ricky. He said, don't you see? I'm talking to Ricky. He said, go close the door. Rob went to close the door. And one of the greatest lines ever, George said, no, Rob, from the other side. <laughs> we hate interruptions, don't we? But we hate distractions. We hate people that, that mess with us. When things are going well or things are going bad. This past week I was reading about uh, King David when he was chased out of the holy city by Absalom. And as he was making his way in order to save his own life, and while things were going down, there was a rascal named Shammai who was going along the hillside, uh, maybe a hundred feet from him, just shouting down curses and mocking David. David in his darkest hour. There was a man beside David who was ready to take his life, but David said, let's keep it in God's hands. I think about the time that the great prophet Elisha, if you're like I am, you're losing hair and you'd say amen. But Elisha was carrying out a ministry and some youth went and said, you old bald head, you old bald head. God sent a number of bear and mauled the youth uh, for their mockery. And so we see here an interruption. We see here a distraction. Paul and Silas and the team, they were carrying out their ministry. And all of a sudden the words come out uh, from the peanut gallery. There's a servant girl and it says for many days she was bothering them. They were on their way and, and, and they met this girl and day after day for a number of days she was distracting them. The scripture says that Paul was greatly annoyed. He was perturbed. He was agitated. He was bothered. You see, Paul is like that professor I mentioned. He had an audience. He had a preparation. He had a task from God. He didn't need this interruption. And so as a result of that, we see that he rebuked uh, the, the spirit and uh, removed it. I was wondering, why was Paul so agitated? What did this woman say that upset him? Why did Paul shut her down? You know, it's very interesting uh, as you look at it, what she says really appears to be very doctrinally sound in verse 17. The, this servant girl was following Paul and crying out, these men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. She seems to be agreeing with them. She seems to be uh, consistent in her message with, with what they were saying. So why is Paul rebuking her? Let me first add, Paul was right in rebuking her. And there are a couple of things that we need consider, to consider. And the first is this, the source. It wasn't just what she was saying, but it's the source of what was being said. Many of y'all remember the infamous Bernie Madoff who passed, by, passed away a couple of years ago. He was infamous as creating the worst Ponzi scheme in the history of the United States, bilking, uh, I think, uh, investors to the tune of $65 billion. Now imagine if Bernie Madoff were still living and I had a financial program and plan in place, I wouldn't want his endorsement. 
Even if he believed in what I was saying, why is that? Because people would say, what in the world is up with Rick? Why would he have this person endorsing what he's doing? You see, we need to understand that, that Satan was empowering this message. He was not the messenger to be endorsing. God's message didn't need endorsing. It didn't need a distraction. What Paul said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was enough to convict individuals, and he did not need the wrong source in it. But I want you to see not only the word source, but start. Just because someone may say something right at the start does not mean that if people follow what that person says and where that person says it, that it will lead to the right place. Often it will not. Over 70 years ago, Richmond, Indiana newspaper told the story of a 21-year-old Protestant minister. He was a go-getter. He was building a recreation center and he united around him various mainline Christian denominations to build this youth center. And the purpose of the youth center with this board of many denominations was this, to teach moral biblical lessons. 25 years later at a compound in Guyana, this same man would lead 900 people to drink the red Kool-Aid taking their lives for a demonic cause. The minister, and I use that name lightly, his name was Jim Jones. He may have said some of the right things at the beginning, but his heart was never right with God. He showed his true colors. You see, Paul had great wisdom here. He did not need the endorsement from the wrong messenger. He realized that if people could easily be confused by, by associating Christianity with the craziness that they saw from this servant girl who lacked control, who was under demonic possession. And he realized that even though what may have been said was right, that if people were to follow the instruction of that individual, it would lead to destruction. So we see Paul was determined and direct with the evil spirit. Nothing was going to interfere with the advancement of the gospel. Oh, that we would have, that I would have, that you would have the desire to see the gospel advance unimpeded, that people would know that Jesus loved them, that they would hear from the right source, that they would hear with the right heart, that, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer. But I want you to see, secondly, the servant girl. She was delivered, and we might say redirected. In fact, it tells us in verse 16 uh, that this slave girl had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Literally, it was uh, what is called a python spirit. You say, well, where does that come? Well, it's a demonic spirit. Uh, but in Greek mythology, python guarded the way to Delphi. And the Greek mythological god uh, Apollo was thought to be embodied in the snake and would have abilities of clairvoyance, of being able to to predict the future. But Paul is very clear here that this was a demonic spirit. You, you, we need to be careful, people, that we don't dabble in the things that are of the occult. Uh, God never said that there couldn't be some reality that comes from it. He said, stay away from it. Saul himself uh, went through the witch at Endor and was rebuked because of that. And we need to avoid such things of the dark world that would uh, try to present themselves as being truth and are not. And so Paul was direct in it and he directly addressed the demon that was in this girl. And so the demon was cast out. Not much is said about this girl after the fact. But we do know that her change was evident because her activity changed. Formerly, she made a lot of money for her owners through this fortune telling. But after, verse 19 tells us that her owners realized that their source for making profit was removed. She was delivered and redirected. She was different. When Jesus touches life, it changes that individual. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. All things become new. And while we do not read anything more about this woman in Scripture, this young girl, we do know that this woman who was formerly valued by her productivity to those who owned her now, now understood the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong, Paul and Silas faced conflict through this, but this woman experienced the peace of knowing that she was freed and that she was loved deeply by God. Well, I want you to see a final group, the accusers. They were disturbed and deceitful. Paul was direct. He stuck to the course. He persevered. He was not going to be distracted. The girl was delivered. And then we see the narrative that ensues after that. While the servant girl who was the battleground was delivered, the pawns of darkness, her owners, were operating in the dark world. You see, the battle was over this servant girl. God desired her. The devil tried to possess her because the devil could distract people and lead away. And so there was this battle. Do you realize that there are people in our community, maybe in our families, there's a battle going on around their lives and the gospel is freeing the power of the gospel. We need to be carrying the truth of God because it is certain that there's war. And these individuals, these pawns of darkness, the owners who were using this young girl for their own gain, they were disturbed. Their source of income was disturbed. I like in a play on words in verses 18 and 19, I was reading what John Stott said about this. He, he said in the play on words that the demon had gone out, the Greek word exelthan, and consequently, the accuser's hope of making money had gone out, excel thin. In other words, the demon went, and when the demon went, their money went. And so these accusers were upset because they were no longer having someone help them through predicting the future to make money. And so guess what they did? They made up a lie. They went to the authorities and they said, we're upset with these guys because they are transgressing Roman law. They're introducing a religion that's unacceptable. They didn't care about Roman law. They cared about making the money. Their money was gone. They weren't happy. You know, there are right ways and wrong ways to make money. The right way is a day's work for a day's pay. The right way is honestly investing your money if you're able to and allowing it to work for you. They're wrong ways. Gambling is wrong. Uh, my favorite preacher, Dr. Adrian Rogers said it best of all. He said, the way God has set up economy is a win-win. If you need your grass cut and I cut your grass, I provide the service, you win. You provide the money to me, I win. And he said, that's the way God has it. The problem with gambling is the very core of it is win-lose. For everyone that wins, someone has to lose. And guess what? If I were a gambler, I'd be on the losing end most of the time. And the way the system is, most everybody else would be on the losing end most of the time. People look for this pipe dream of making millions of dollars. And for everyone that does it, there are millions who don't invest wisely. Another way that's wrong to make money is using dishonest measures. Scripture tells us that there's supposed to be balance in measurements. There's supposed to be equal measurements. Another way and we see here is using people to pocket money. God hates that. Paul hated that. Using people. If you are in a position to employ people, don't look at them as property. Look at them as individuals. Care about them. Don't use them as pawns in your system. But there's something else that was wrong here. And it's this. These people chose their way of making money over Jesus. They chose to get rid of Paul who carried the message of Jesus rather than lose their money. And so they sought to stop Paul. And here's the battle. Verse 19 says they seized them. 
And it says later in that verse, they dragged them into the marketplace. The marketplace at that time wasn't only a place where people would transact business, but it was also a place where decisions would be made locally. They brought them before the chief magistrates, verse 20. They charged them as breakers of the law, verse 21, which again was a trumped up charge. They had them beaten with rods, verse 22, and they threw them into jail. People, they may have been the pawns, but there was a spiritual warfare going. And when the gospel is moving, we can expect it. This servant girl was freed, but Paul and them were placed in outer conflict. Listen, the gospel is the message of life. The devil wants to silence us. And when we start to proclaim the gospel, we shouldn't be surprised that there might be external conflict. The very interesting thing of this is they thought, the accusers did, they had won. Their imagination was, we're going to get them in trouble. We're going to put them in jail and we're going to stop the gospel. But guess what happened? We're going to see next week they go into the jail and they lead the, the jailer into salvation and the jailer's family. And guess what? They're not going to stay in that prison forever. The gospel cannot be stopped. So we see here Paul and Silas in conflict and it was going to become even more so. The servant girl delivered and freed, understanding what it is to truly be loved, and the accusers in a stir without an answer. You know, as we have been studying in these few weeks, the thing that has impressed me the most is Paul persevered in ministry. Listen, especially in these days of COVID, it can be so fatiguing, can it be? And so many times I, I've been talking with ministers around the area and even beyond the area, and we're all just amazed that small groups, the, the attendances drop 50%, and this is happening across the board. Uh, small groups of people engaged in the study of the Word of God. We need to persevere. We need to persevere in it. In the midst of conflict, persevere. I was listening to Dr. Rogers preach this week. He was saying, when you become a Christian, is there joy or is there conflict? He said, yes, it's both. And that's true. If you're doing the work of God, press on. Press on in it. Stay strong in it. If it's music ministry, carry out the ministry. What a blessing Sharon is. Everything she went through in 2023, she's still standing. And what? Singing today. If it is uh, carrying out some act of service that you're doing in the church, do it as unto the Lord. Seek for ways to advance the gospel, but persevere in it. Why is that? Because there's a battle. There's a battle. It's very real. And the stakes are high. Think about that servant girl. We don't read much about her, but she was free. And there are people in our community, people in the world today, if they would just hear the gospel of Christ, they would be freed. Do you want to be that messenger? Do you want to persevere in it? Whatever ministry God's called you. Paul was faithful. Silas was faithful. The conflict we're going to see next week continues. But the gospel continues to move. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That while there will be hucksters who will try to mislead people like a Jim Jones. That while there will be people like we see in these biblical accounts who try to contest the gospel at every point. Father, the, the gospel message is irrepressible. But Father, you've called us to carry it. Lord, help us to persevere in ministry. Whatever ministry you've called us to, what an example we see in Paul that, that he directly addresses things and continues to move forward without being distracted. And when conflict occurs, and we're going to see next week, even when he's put in an uncomfortable, unexpected situation, he continues to do what you called him to do where he is. 
And so, Lord, we just lift to you this prayer. We pray today, if there be any who have not trusted you, that today would be the day that they would say, I want to be on the winning side. I want to be with Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.